We're back. This is Dame Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Energy 808, The Cutting Edge, uh, with Marco Mangelsdorf and me. And in a moment, we're going to talk to him seriously and drill down on the subject of what's going on in energy and otherwise in Southeast Asia. Welcome to the show, Marco. It's always nice to talk to you. Welcome back. From well, Southeast thank you. Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a while since you and I have spoken uh, with me actually being home in Hilo. So it's uh, great to be back in Hawaii Ne, and uh, great to be back with you. Yeah, you to me, you stand for the proposition that you've got to get out and travel. You've got to keep your curiosity going. You, you've got to keep your mind going and you do go. And more often than not, you go to Asia and Southeast Asia and you're just back from a trip to a number of countries there. Uh, where did you go uh, and why did you go to those places? Well, great question. A little bit of background. Uh, so I taught a course last spring at the University of California, Santa Cruz, on the politics of Southeast Asia. Uh, specifically, and since there's kind of a differentiation between when you think of Southeast Asia, I think of the 10 ASEAN country, the uh, Association for Southeast Asian Nations. and those uh, include also island nations like, uh, for example, the Philippines, Brunei. And I choose to keep my focus on what's referred to by some as mainland Southeast Asia, which is five countries, makes up half of ASEAN approximately, or not approximately, but exactly in terms of the number of countries. And that includes from the most populous to the least populous, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, and then Lao bringing up the, the caboose as far as the smallest country population wise. So I went to all five of those, except no notable caveat, except Myanmar. Uh, I actually got as far as the Myanmar border in northern Thailand at the border frontier town of Maesai uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And I went to the border crossing, which is over a small stream the Ruak River, R-U-A-K, and it was uh, completely shut down. So on the Thai side, on the Myanmar side, fences are up. Nobody mans the post, so to speak, because it's been closed since COVID and or since the coup against Aung San Suu Kyi, February of 2021. So I decided not to uh, go gonzo, guerrilla, a reporter and get into to Myanmar. That just didn't seem to me to be a very safe thing to do. So my yeah, focus. We, we, we've seen that movie and it doesn't end well. Yeah, yeah, they take hostages there. So I was focused on Thailand, principally northern Thailand, uh, Laos. Those are the two places I spent the most time, and then also some time in Cambodia and in Vietnam. Fabulous trip. That's the heart and soul of it. By the way, just as a digression, last week we had a uh, really interesting show with a guy named Robert Petit, it's a French name, um, and we talked to him, uh, he's a lawyer, at his office in Ottawa. And he was the chief prosecutor uh, in the Cambodian war crimes uh, against you know, the successes to Pol Pot and all that. And uh, he had a lot to say about exactly how those war crimes and that trial or trials uh, affected Cambodia. Cambodia is different than the others, isn't it? Well, I mean, Jay, they're, they're all unique in their own way. And I mean, what you refer to is this uh, long going trials of a number of individuals associated kind of the top echelon of the Pol Pot uh, heinous murderous regime. And those under the auspices of the United Nations went on for years and years and years. And, you know, the interesting thing about, well, there are many interesting things about each country, but Cambodia attracted a lot of international community attention and a tremendous amount of money. I mean, we're talking billions of dollars after the civil war there came to an end, the late 1990s. And it is um, how to characterize Cambodia. It is, it is a, a, an authoritarian strongman state under Hun Sen, who has been in power now since 1985. Uh, he's grooming his, his son, uh, Hun Manet, to take over for him at some point. But it's very clear to me that, that Hun Sen is still very much attached to being 
El Primero, uh, the number one there uh, guy by far. And you know, I kind of also put Cambodia in the category of, along with Laos, being very closely drawn into the orbit of the People's Republic of China, the large neighbor to, to the north. And in place, especially places in Scenicville, along the coast there, Scenicville, which I have no desire to go to, but all the reports I have is that Chinese, both clean money and a lot of dirty money, have filtered into Scenicville. And it's almost, uh, from what I read, consistently kind of an outpost of, of China and uh, you know, human trafficking, prostitution, uh, prisoner type call centers. So Cambodia, Cambodia is, uh, is kind of a rough and ready country, but interestingly, you know, they, uh, they've had a lot of economic growth and, uh, you know, with uh, China opening up as of a couple of weeks ago in terms of allowing people out, they, along with uh, Thailand and Laos, especially are touting the return uh, en masse of Boku Chinese tourists coming for days at a time and spending Boku Yuan, yuan uh, in their local economies. Well, one of the most interesting things that uh, Robert Petit imparted was that there was a vision. Opart had a vision. And um, the idea was they knew what they were doing. They wanted to kill you know, most of the country, leaving only a, um, you know, a remnant of the population. But, but this remnant of the population would live well. It was um, a utopian vision, which just happened to include, you know, the, um, the mass murder of millions of people. I find that really interesting. And they believed that. They accepted that. It motivated them. That was his plan. Well, it, it seems like kind of an abomination to refer to anything that went on post that uh, overthrow of the law and all government. And I think it was April ish of 1975 in using the U word as in utopian because it was the antithesis, antithesis of, of utopia was the dystopia to the nth degree. And I mean, he wanted to return the country in his own words to year zero, force the uh, the, the the forced evacuation of people from the, the cities such as uh, Phnom Penh. And I mean, it was a one of the most heinous uh, regimes. Uh, of the of the 20th century, and you know one of the things that anybody who goes to Phnom Penh or many other places in Cambodia, there are uh, so-called killing fields and museums, which I've I've gone to one. Tool Sling 21 is was a notorious spot actually in Phnom Penh, which was a school built by the French. Uh, turned into a place of horrors by by Pol Pot uh, after the revolution in '75, and that's uh, I've been there, and it's just uh, it's just beyond words. And there is a killing field not too far out of Phnom Penh, which is easy enough to get to, where you can walk and take it all in and see these monstrously large uh, showcases, which is an odd word, showcases of human skulls that each represented a living, breathing person at some point. So very brutal. And, you know, there was a play at the Manoa Valley Theater a few months ago called uh, the Cambodian Rock Band, and it, it's believe it or not, it's a musical, but it tells the story of uh, that Camp Twenty One you're talking about, mm -hmm. which was the center of a lot of brutality in Cambodia. Uh, this is a very interesting play because it's it's mixed with um, you know the the brutality, the atrocities. And, and and a hope for a better Cambodia. So you're right. I mean, people have come from all over the world to try to make something of it, to improve it, and they've given a lot of money to it. Um, but it carries this legacy around with it. And you know, an interesting backdrop, Jay, is the city of Siem Reap, which is uh, not all that far from from Phnom Penh. It's uh, near the the largest freshwater lake in all of Southeast Asia, the Tonle Sap, which is kind of a miracle in and of itself. And Siem Reap is the, uh, the base, so to speak, of the Angkor Wat complex, which um, if, you, if you ever have the time, if you haven't already looked into Angkor Wat, it is, it is truly stunning. It's one of the marvels of the world, a, uh, 
a community of uh, up to a, a city of up to a million people back in the day when London was this podunk town on the Thames River <laughs> that lasted for approximately 500 years from roughly 900 ish to 1400 something. And uh, I got a chance to, to spend several days there back in November, and it was truly a, an awesome place to, uh, to take in. And just kind of one, one takeaway uh, to share with you is there was no better engineers, water engineers uh, on the planet than the folks who built the water system in and around Angkor Wat. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, so much of Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, it has been, uh, uh, you know, the, the rhythm of life is dictated by two distinct seasons. One is the rainy monsoon season, typically from, I'm going to say, June to September. And the other is, is the dry season. And the key is to be able to take the copious amounts of water that fall from the sky during the rainy season and store it for people to use for agriculture when it's, there's very little rain. And they did a masterful job for hundreds of years. They built these huge barai, they call them barai, which is a Khmer word for reservoirs. And they did a masterful, masterful job. Uh, what really did them in, one of the things that did the, the place of Angkor Wat in after a 500 year run was a series of droughts that went on for approximately 20 years, which brings me or brings us, should bring us to so many parts of the world today. Well, where... it's interesting you talk about, um, you know, drought versus flood, and all of that happens in California now, yes. and there are voices being raised about why can't we save the water uh, from the flood and uh, apply it to the drought. That's, as you say, that's a very hard engineering problem, um, but that's what the world is faced with, and I was going to ask you, how has climate change uh, expressed itself, uh, you know, in these countries that you visited? Well, and uh, I'll be happy to answer that question more directly, but let's finish up the, the story of Angkor Wat because it, it has to do with water. So after somewhere in the 20 year range of, of successive droughts, well, uh, the engineers got creative. They were able to make do with less and they essentially fiddled with the infrastructure and the architecture of their water collection and distribution system. And they were able to tough it out. Well, guess what happened after 20 years? Well, we see, saw a repeat of that in December and January in California. You had torrential rain. I mean, we're talking rain bombs. So that clobbered the engineers and the city's ability to cope after going of 20 years of drought. They went to rain bombs and they thought uh, and massive flooding and an inability to cope. So they, they tried to deal with that. Well, what happened after the rain bomb? I give you one guess. What happens after the rain bomb? Everything is destroyed. Well, that, that's a good guess. But the droughts, the droughts came back again. There were more droughts after a year or two of heavy rains. And so they had to adapt again or try to adapt. And after a number of attempted adaptations, and it's still something of a mystery, they decided to evacuate and the, the, the this complex, which is truly beyond words, and it's, there are many complexes there uh, in the region, uh, they, they evacuated, they left. And it wasn't until supposedly a French archeologist whose name escapes me in the 1800s came across this lost city where you had these incredible ruins that were being taken over by the jungle and monkeys were running wild and so forth and so on. So it's a cautionary tale, I feel, to what we're seeing in many parts of the world now. And uh, you know, California has been hit by by record record flooding. So, what has the, the 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 water situation? What's going on in Southeast Asia? Well, up until last year, they had suffered through a handful of years of guess what, drought, very low rainfall, low precipitation amounts during the monsoon which caused the rivers such as the Mekong, which is kind of the, the Marquis River, which travels more than 2000 miles from the headlands in the Himalayan Plateau and the People's Republic of China, all the way down, snaking its way to uh, empty out uh, the south, southeast of, of Saigon, of Ho Chi Minh City. So up until last year, which was uh, a relatively normal, in quotation marks, normal rain year, they were maybe 
there are 70 million or so people who live along the Mekong. There are a bunch more people who live along the many, many tributaries to the Mekong. So it has had a serious impact on the lives of tens of millions of people. And politically and security wise, it has caused tensions between the lower Mekong countries of Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand, and the people in China, the authorities in China. So there's been a push and pull and, and pushing on the part of the lower Mekong countries to the Chinese to, you need to release more water from your dams. And we're, again, we're seeing this in multiple parts of the world where number one, water is an increasingly scarce commodity. And number two, that is leading to fierce fights amongst the people who for decades or centuries have depended upon the water. Look what's going on in the Colorado River. That's turning into perhaps one of the worst cluster blanks that one can imagine in terms of water rights and distribution in the United States. So uh, the water situation is critical. They've had a good year last year, so it's kind of less it's less five alarm bell right now, but this is not going to go away. And the tension between the lower Mekong countries and the People's Republic of China is bound to continue. I think you could find a common denominator and say that uh, problems with water, whether it's drought or flood or a combination, a combination is really bad, uh, <clears throat> has a political effect. And furthermore, it has a geopolitical effect. Um, you, you haven't mentioned Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has had floods, it had drought. Uh, now, now it has uh, changed its loyalties and it is buying gas and oil from Putin. Um, and that takes a risk with its relationship with the United States. So, and of course, the, uh, I think the prime minister is stepping down uh, and there'll be new elections. So uh, gee whiz, you know, it's in a, it's in a state of, mm, it's in a state of concern, a disruption. And, and all as a result of the weather. Well, disruption is galore. And, uh, and another thing that's kind of free associating here, I mean, let's look at Vietnam. Uh, one of the most productive and fertile uh, historical and ongoing areas where Vietnam uh, grows rice and rice is a staple food for Vietnamese. Rice is a staple food for people across Southeast Asia, not only mainland Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and the issue with lower water, less water, coming all the way down, making its way to the Mekong uh, River Delta before it empties into the East Sea, as the Vietnamese call it. Uh, there's less and less water, which means there's more and more uh, infiltration of saline, of, of salt water, which is having and will have uh, more and more uh, detrimental effect to a major industry and stable food of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. So, I mean, the consequences of less water across Southeast Asia are, are monumental, number one. And number two, uh, I, can't, I can't say I feel very optimistic that there's going to be much of a change as far as the direness of the, the shortage of water, the distribution of water, the control of water flow. And just to kind of bring this more home for me, my home in Southeast Asia, uh, my heart home, H-E-A-R-T, is Luang Prabang, which uh, translated from Lao means Big Buddha. It's right along the Mekong River. And there's a dam being proposed about 20 kilometers upstream of Luang Prabang that's being built by Thai money. And I hired a boat to go up uh, stream to actually see this dam site. And uh, interestingly, just when we happened to be going by, there was a, a couple people in a, in a safety boat. It had a white flag with a green cross on it. Okay, so we saw it in the distance there. It was in the water. And this guy comes out with his bullhorn yelling and loud. It wasn't angry yelling, but he was just letting us know, hey, guys, there's going to be blasting going on soon. Better get out of the way. So we continued upstream. We waited there, and we heard a number of large booms. So this is all part of the excavation and the blasting of dynamite to build this dam. And this dam, it is feared by many enviros, rightly so, could have a definitely very uh, definite, uh, I said it twice now, uh, a deleterious effect on the UNESCO heritage city town of Luang Prabang. So that's, that's an example of it happening very close to home. But I'll, I'll also add this, Jay. 
the attitude or the, the knowledge of people in Luang Prabang of this dam is, is little to nothing right now. And I'm kind of thinking, well, how can they not be concerned about it? How can they not be aware of this? And it's, very, it's a very human answer to that. It's because they are dealing with much more proximate uh, concerns and threats to their, to their daily livelihoods. And just to kind of riff on Lao for a minute, last month, December of last month, the Lao government reported that the year-over-year -year inflation in Lao December of 2022 compared to December 21 was close to 40%, 40% inflation. Wow. So that is what really concerns people much more so than some hypothetical dam, which is not so hypothetical, but it's not affecting their lives right now. It's what's in front of them right now. And also the continuing after effects of COVID uh, devastating so much of, of the country's economy. Now, I thought you were going to talk about um, that's somewhere in here, uh, the development of the economies of the of these countries. Um, you know, the up and coming Southeast Asia, um, the, their international connections, their industry, their effort at building tourism, uh, you know, their, you know, internal economic strength. But what I hear is that that's really not happening. No, au contraire, my friend. Uh, there's still a very, very strong focus on tourism. I, I typically read on a daily basis. I read the press from Thailand, from Laos, and Cambodia. Less so in Myanmar because it's hard to get you know on the ground objective reporting in Myanmar because it's such a hostile situation there. And less so in Vietnam. I find that the press in Vietnam is usually so. It reminds me of the Soviet days, where it's talking about meeting this plan and meeting this particular production level. And it's, it's rather bland for my taste. But I, I do focus on, like I said, Lao, Vietnam, uh, Lao, Thailand, and Cambodia. And all of them have been giving very prominent uh, coverage to the reopening of China, Chinese tourists coming en masse as the, the, the flight capacity is increased from major Chinese cities. So they are uh, very much, I'm going to say, almost pandering to the Chinese to come, 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 come and spend money, spend money, spend money. So uh, I think that's likely to happen. And, uh, and especially in places like Laos and Cambodia, where uh, they're, they're already so kind of in, intertwined in, in the Chinese orbit, kind of less so in Thailand, but still nonetheless a very uh, a big player. This doesn't make me feel all that comfortable about Southeast Asia. I mean, it sounds like Hawaii pandering for, um, you know, hospitality guests uh, to come from all over the world. But, in, you know, in a way, you sell your soul. In a way, you, you, have, you lose your opportunity of uh, building, you know, internal industry. Um, so query, uh, is it sustainable what they are doing, trying to attract the Chinese uh, travelers? Well, um, let's look at a few numbers. So pre-COVID, 2019, the percentage of the economies in at least, I'm going to say Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia, and I don't have the numbers to the penny right off the top of my head, but it's going to be a reasonable assumption to say that the total economies of these three mainland Southeast Asia countries, uh, tourism made up uh, between 10 to 20 percent, probably more like the, in the 15 percent range, 15 percent of the entire economies of Thailand, Cambodia and Laos were based on tourism. That is a big segment. And they want to go back to that, from what I can tell, and then some. Now, in terms of is it sustainable? Uh, I believe that places like Cambodia and Thailand, which are larger countries, uh, are going to be able to probably be, this is kind of a gross generalization, be less impacted. That said, Laos, I feel being a smaller country, only 7 million some odd people is going to be more impacted. And to make this really real for me, the city of Luang Prabang, again, about 50,000 on the Mekong, uh, as of December of 2021, has now a high-speed rail line that goes from the southern Chinese city in uh, Hunan province, Yunnan province, excuse me, of Kunming, a train that goes from Kunming all the way down to the Lao Chinese border, Boten, 
and then down uh, to Vientiane, the terminus, uh, which is the capital uh, in southern, a kind of mid part of uh, Lao, of, of uh, the Lao People's Democratic Republic. And up until now, Jay, and I keep track of this because I'm very interested about it. Up until now, there has been no people traffic from China into Laos. There's been freight traffic, but no people traffic. But it is inevitable, sooner rather than later, that there will be, I'm guessing here, reasonable guess, three to four trains per day from Kunming going to Vientiane of which those three to four trains, trains per day will stop in Luang Prabang. And somewhere, somewhere in the, let's say several hundred people from China, Chinese tourists, will get off in Luang Prabang three or four times a day. So let's just do the math. 250 Chinese tourists coming off the train four times a day, that's a thousand people. They're gonna need transportation, into town because the train station is is out of town on a pretty windy road of about 20 minutes and they're needed they need to go places they'll need to be lodged they'll want to shop they want to do things so on this particular instance it's very real and tangible to me as far as the increase in chinese coming into southeast asia in this case lao in this case luang prabang on the new train that was paid for 70 percent debt financing to pay for by the Chinese, or I, I should say, excuse me, it was paid for all by the Chinese um, and it is owned 70% by the Chinese on a long-term note that the Lao government will have to repay. They say, so they this, it's a note, it's, that's a, means it's a debt, six, not, six, owner, not ownership, but debt. No? Correct, six, six billion dollar train line. So in this particular instance, and I've spoken to business owners, I've spoken to people on the street, they're in Luang Prabang, and there is there is a level of trepidation and anxiety, not when this is going to happen, as in, excuse me, not if it's going to happen, because everybody knows when it's going to happen, but the impact is going to be on this UNESCO World Heritage Town. And one of my friends who's been there, he's an ex, a French expat, went native, married a, a Lao woman, have a couple of kids, has been living there for, gosh, close to 20 years. And he said, Marco, you got to understand something. People don't do anything here until it smacks them in the face. So there's no planning going on, according to him. There's no, there's no real kind of contingency plan as to how to deal with a thousand Chinese tourists coming off the train every single day. So it'll be whopping upside the head uh, when it happens. And then they'll try to figure out what to do with this uh, humongous increase in people coming into this small town. I assume this is part of Belt Road. Oh, yeah. I mean, that sounds like a, an important part. And the Chinese are, you know, very interested in making it work. Um, but uh, McQuarrie, you know, you have the debt trap problem. These countries can hardly afford to pay that, that, uh, that loan back. And uh, they may come, you know, up to a point where they can't pay it back. And then China will own the rail. Yeah, there's been a fair amount of press about that over the years. And the challenge is, since the BRI, Belt Road Initiative, has been a hallmark of core leader, eternal leader, Xi Dada, a.k.a. Xi Jinping, there is little to no honest, objective, balanced analysis from the Chinese on the kind of pluses and minuses, the balance sheet of BRI, because coming up with any type of analysis that is somehow challenging or critical of Xi Jinping's hallmark program, it's just not, uh, it's not in the realm of possibility. So I, I'm not a BRA spe BRI specialist. I haven't taken a super deep dive into it, but I'm certainly aware of some of the Western literature on it that have expressed concern and kind of an interesting tangent, but nonetheless, it's, uh, uh, I think it's very pertinent here. So there's going to be a, an election in Thailand in May, assuming it goes forward. And uh, just brief Thai political history. So uh, Yinluk Shinawat was overthrown by Prayut Chan-o-cha, 
who was, I believe, Army Chief of Staff in 2014. And uh, Prayut, General Prayut, now Prime Minister Prayut, has been in power now since uh, 2014. And there's a lot of maneuvering going on right now with multiple political parties uh, in Thailand. I'm following this very closely. Well, uh, the most popular party, according to the polls, is, uh, is the Putai Party, P-H-E-U, Putai Party. And that is essentially a party of the Shinawat family. First, it was Toxin Shinawat who, who ran in, I believe, 2001, ran in a lounge. Uh, won in a landslide, then he won re-election. Four years later, in 2005, he was overthrown by the military in 2005, and he's been in exile ever since. So now, get this, his daughter, whose name is uh, nickname is Ying Un, Ying Un, she is all 35, she is now the Putai Party Prime Minister candidate. And like I said, their party, that party, is by far ahead in terms of the polls. And if you look at the platform of the Putai Party, it reads like an incredible laundry list as far as pandering, pandering to so many parts of the Thai populace and the Thai political structure. But one of the things that really caught my attention, I was scrolling down all the things they were promising, oh, elect us, and this is what you, what you can get from us, is that uh, Putai is making very clear that they want to work more closely with China in terms of infrastructure projects, and they explicitly voice support for continuing uh, this high-speed rail, which now the terminus is Vientian, which is just on the Lao side of the Mekong, in that particular part of uh, Lao and Thailand. And the plan or the thought has been over the years to continue that across the Mekong and have it go all the way to Bangkok and south to the Gulf of Thailand which is what the Chinese very much want to see because that'll give them even further access. It'll give them open ocean access. So the Thais have been very kind of squirrely on this to some extent because they don't want to get in debt with the Chinese. And it's not going to be the same deal as the Lao government had to submit itself to to get the uh, the, the rail line from, from Kunming to Bientian. So it's going to be a different beast. But I found it very interesting that this most popular, according to the polls, political party in Thailand is saying, we want closer relations with China. We want to continue the rail line, which I'm, you know, we're talking, if they say yes, it's going to be, I don't know, five to eight years that it would actually take to go online. So it's still a big question mark. It's going to take a lot of money. But I found it very interesting that, that China and the relationship with Thailand and China is very much in the top tier of political subjects when it comes to Thai politics. Well, it, it, it sounds like a kind of uh, Belt Road um, uh, imperialism, if you will. It also sounds like maybe uh, a, a bit of corruption is in play here, don't you think? Oh, you had to use the C word. Uh, well, there is, um, and, and there are, uh, a number of uh, what I believe to be impartial and objective uh, international rating organizations that will look at countries and rate them in terms of levels of transparency and corruption. So I, uh, I looked into this in some detail when I taught my course and I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head, but I can, uh, it's not gonna surprise you when I tell you that the countries of Southeast Asia do not rank very high on the transparency and open honest government scale. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just a fact of life. You've got a one party, Communist Party dominance in Laos. Uh, it's the same in China. You've got one family rule in Cambodia. Myanmar is a mix. You know, it's a military junta that's doing atrocious, heinous things to its people. And then, uh, uh, who did I leave out here? Oh, Viet, uh, let's see. Cambodia, one party rule or one one man rule. I think I've, I've nailed them all. Well, you know, so, if you're spending billions on a project, you know, it's it's kind of built in to peel off a few bucks, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, to get people on your side of the project. It's, it's uh, uh, there's no reason why not actually, in, at least uh, in that part of the world. But let me, let me, uh, let me go to one thing and it's, I'm sort of building a curiosity on this. You go because you teach a course in California. You go because you're an energy guy and you spent 
your you know your career in energy and, and a politics guy too let's not forget and politics. you're a politics guy the politics of energy as a matter of fact um you go because you're curious you go because you know people and you go because you like the cultures that they're meaningful um you go because it's kind of the last great relatively civilized frontier in the world to visit um you go for the creature comforts which i'm sure are available in all of those countries, in their own way, um, and you go to get away. What did I miss? Well, you pretty much nailed it, Jay. You pretty much nailed it. I think I'll just add that you know, in terms of curiosity, a corollary to curiosity is the desire to know and to learn more, to learn more. And it was really kind of fascinating. I wasn't planning to be up in far north Thailand, far northern Thailand. It was kind of the last. Uh, on a spur of the moment thing, but I said, you know, while I'm here, I should go check out Chiang Rai, which is farther north than Chiang Mai, and even go further north from Chiang Rai to Maesai, which is the border with uh, Myanmar and Laos and the so-called Golden Triangle. And uh, so I went up there, and I was immensely drawn to the region. And even though it's kind of interesting, even though it was time for me to come home after three plus months on the road. So I felt filled to the brim, okay, filled to the brim. It wasn't one of these feelings of, oh, I wish I would have had more time here or there. So I came home at the perfect time and I'm already planning my next trip later this year because one of the things I've learned is that I can really only handle Southeast Asia two months of the year. And those are December and January. Why? Because the rest of the year, it is so darn hot and I, I wilt in the heat. So, uh, to, to wrap that up, I mean, I, I just, there's more for me to learn, you know, and it's uh, it's a fascinating part of the world. I can't go to every part of the world and learn, 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 because uh, I'm, I'm fine. I like the rest of us, but I have a particular interest in uh, parts of Southeast Asia. So I feel very blessed. Yes, I, I and you should. Uh, travel is broadening. We always knew that, but we don't, you know, Americans don't play that the way perhaps they used to. You know, I'm thinking of the Peace Corps. People, People who are hungry to find other places and learn about them and adopt them and, and fold them into their own worldview. Um, and you've done that. And it's, it's a message to all people, young people especially, um, to get out and make these trips to learn about it and have a, maybe a, an effect on it. But in any event, express the curiosity that you're talking about. I, I hope you, you do it again and again. And I hope uh, when you come back each time that we can we can visit together like this and you can tell us your impressions. Um, well, thank hope, you. And I hope that you write it up a little bit too. Well, and with the magic of the internet, which is pretty much everywhere I went, so rather reliably, fortunately, since I'm so tethered to keeping in touch and to working from afar, is uh, we can do shows from places like Shanghai or Maesai or, uh, you know, within sight. The Golden Triangle is kind of cool because you can see Lao on the other side of the Mekong, and you can see Myanmar on the other side of the Ruek River. So, uh, yes, here, here. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for having me. Thanks for coming on, Marco. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Marco Mangelsdorf, our co-host on uh, Energy 808, The Cutting Edge, uh, and more. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.